All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the Innovate Pasadena Ask Me Anything series. Um, and today our guest uh, expert who will be answering your questions is Jay Goss. Uh, Jay is a general partner at Wavemaker 360, a venture capital firm that's focused on the healthcare industry. And uh, Jay has been a, a wonderful friend to Innovate Pasadena, a member of the Pasadena community. Um, and so he will be answering all of your questions on um, healthcare industry, on healthcare disruption, meeting venture capital. So Jay, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to it. So did I miss anything? Just a quick blurb or you could do a quick promo about Wavemaker um, and your presence in uh, Pasadena or your personal focus. Well, I'll, I'll give you a quick thumbnail on the on the fund. Um, so we are in Pasadena. We're I'm talking to you back at, back in our building in Pasadena. We, we hadn't been in Pasadena for a little over a year as as most people were dealing with the pandemic. But we're back. We're at um in the, for those of you that know Pasadena, we're one of the two tall buildings that are just at the intersection of the freeway and lake. I'm in the western building, and the sky beneath behind me is the is the sky facing south on lake. Anyway, we're a, we are a venture capital fund. Um, in most regards, we're a, a venture capital fund that's structured the way almost all venture capital funds certainly in California and really throughout the United States are set up. What makes our fund a, a little bit different are two basic uh, strategic decisions we made. The first one being unlike 90 plus percent of all venture funds that focus on many, many different industries, we focus on investing into startups that are only in the healthcare industry. So we don't, we don't, uh, know anything or try to know anything about self-driving cars or Snapchat or electric scooters or any of the other stuff that uh, venture capital firms tend to get excited about and invest into. We stay in, in our lane and our lane is healthcare. And more importantly, or as important, we are not focused within healthcare on anything in the bio, in the area of biotherapeutics. So we're we're comparatively narrowly focused in that we're healthcare only and no biotech within healthcare. Um, and then the other uh, specialty, and I think it, it kind of lends itself maybe to some of the questions that might get asked, is um, we go a step beyond in terms of our healthcare orientation. In that our fund. Our fund's investors, the people that we've raised capital from and use their capital to invest in startups, which is the business model of most venture capital funds, comes out of the healthcare industry. So most of our investors are what are called limited partners, are coming from the healthcare industry, either their corporations or institutions that make up the U.S. healthcare system, hospitals, health systems, people like that, or they're the men and women that run those big healthcare organizations. So we have people on the hospital and health system side, on the payer side, on the post-acute side. We tend to have a lot, and we have about 200 of these investors now. So we have a lot of men and women that have big, big jobs throughout the U.S. healthcare system. And that helps us do our job better. We're a relatively small team of about 12 people here in Pasadena with a secondary office in New York City. But much more importantly are these 200 men and women that are sprinkled all over the U.S. healthcare system and give us a, a lens into what's going on vis-a-vis -vis healthcare. And importantly, especially for the sake of this talk, what's going on with healthcare disruption and healthcare innovation and healthcare entrepreneurship, as opposed to just being a small shop in Pasadena that couldn't possibly cover the entire United States when it comes to that subject matter. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about who we are. Awesome. I didn't know half of that. So <laughs> that was great. So we uh, do encourage everybody here to um, type a question for Jay in the chat. Um, or if you're really feeling brave, you could request the microphone from us. But some people who signed up asked a few questions ahead of time, and I'm sharing those on the screen with you now. So our first question comes from an anonymous um, attendee today. And they ask, how will the healthcare industry change post-COVID-19? 
Yeah, so that's been a, an interesting, evolving question. You know, we, venture capitalists, especially healthcare venture capitalists, have been getting this question a lot since maybe the middle of the pandemic all the way to today. Um, and, I, and I think I look at it two two ways. The first the first way is is how is the the inside of the healthcare industry changing, um, which is you know the activities um, that go on inside what we consider to be the the nuts and bolts of the healthcare industry. And what you've seen is just a lot of what I think of as innovation innovation lubrication. The, the pandemic has caused an industry that's not terribly innovative, and it probably shouldn't be, by the way. It's, 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 the healthcare is, is intrinsically and ought to be intrinsically a conservative industry. It's not going to be on the cutting edge of just about anything because the very nature of the services it you know, provides. If the healthcare industry got too innovative or became too reckless, you know, people die. In other industries, they can afford to be more... Um, innovative because there's not as much at stake, you know, in terms of life or death, with with the exception of the pharmaceutical industry that's always out there on the cutting edge. Um, but the the pandemic and COVID is a, has has both pushed and pulled the healthcare industry into being more innovative. There's more CPT codes for more reimbursement. There's more acceptance both on the demand side and supply side of things like telehealth and remote patient monitoring the f we've seen the fda behave di- more we've seen the fda behave differently since covid than we did pre-covid um that certainly they they haven't loosened up wildly but the fda is is moving faster in response of in response to covid and that's seeping into other areas around regulating healthcare whether it's on the drug side or the uh, medical device side. So I think that's that's my broad answer for how it's affecting the inner workings of the healthcare industry. But then there's another side of the, of the question, which is the healthcare industry is, is becoming broader. It's almost becoming a horizontal. And what I mean by that is almost any other industry not called healthcare has had to become more healthcare oriented. So if you think about it just broadly, whether your business is a cruise ship, whether it's a entertainment industry, whether it's a manufacturing, whether it's education, there's so many industries that have been impacted by the pandemic. And those industries have had to have increased their capability around healthcare. And that's still the healthcare industry. So I think what we're also finding is that Industries that, or businesses that wouldn't typically have said, I'm in the healthcare industry, are having to up their game in healthcare. You, you go back to, to an example like a cruise ship. Uh, three, four, or five months ago, none of us were getting on a cruise ship. And today, we're only getting on a cruise ship if that cruise ship can demonstrate that it has healthcare or medical capabilities that are far greater than what it would have needed to have demonstrated a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, we just got on a cruise ship. We had fun. It maybe had a closet somewhere on the cruise ship that was a first aid closet, and that was good enough for us. Now the average American or human isn't going to get on a cruise ship unless it has a little mini hospital on that cruise ship. It, that, 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 that would be where our expectations are if we're going to get on a big boat and you know, travel the world in that cruise ship. So you can see that you know, in concerts and sports stadiums and movie theaters and education and, and on and on and on. There's so many places where – Healthcare has now seeped into non traditionally non healthcare industries, and that's needed. And it's also a great opportunity for healthcare entrepreneurs. So we do have um, another uh, audience member had asked us uh, how investing in healthcare innovation startups will support our current healthcare ecosystem. So it seems like the first question is leading into this question. Yeah, this is, I think the best place to start with this question is just to think about how taxed, uh, and I don't mean financially taxed, but resource taxed the healthcare system is. Um, The, demand for healthcare services at the at the macro level 
is great and getting greater, largely because of, at least in the United States, the aging baby boomer population. Human beings tend to consume the majority of their healthcare services. The majority of what we consume and spend on healthcare happens at or around the time we turn 65 and, until end of life. Um, so, in so insofar as any country has an aging population, that means the healthcare system is going to get taxed more. It needs more of everything. It needs more healthcare facilities, whether that's a clinic or a hospital or a surgery center or a skilled nursing facility or even home health. Um, and it needs more people. It needs more nurses. It needs more doctors. It needs more allied healthcare professionals. And that is where, this, where the United States is. And, and it's going to get from where it is today, it's going to go from taxed to more taxed because every every day we are retiring about 10,000, actually now more than 10,000 people are retiring. Um, and about the time they're retiring is about the time they became a bigger customer of the U.S. healthcare system. So what we need to be doing, and venture capital and innovation plays a big part of this, is rethinking some of what we do, not all of what we do, but some of what we do in the healthcare industry to be able to serve more people with the same amount of resources, because we can't build our way out of this. There's, there's, there's probably 40 or 50 major cities in the United States that even if you wanted to add a new six or seven or 800 bed hospital, there'd be no place to put that six or seven or 800 bed hospital in those major cities in the United States. So the strategy that we've used pretty successfully for the last 50 years, which is hospital after hospital after hospital, is not going to work going forward. We're going to have to find other ways to take care of our population. That could be things around home health. That could be things around relying more on surgery centers than we do on hospitals. That could be things around digital health and remote patient monitoring. But that exciting, innovative stuff that gets done by healthcare entrepreneurs and gets funded by healthcare investors is what's going to help the U.S. healthcare system in essence, get out of the predicament that we're going to be in, given the, the aging population that we have in the United States. And to, to continue in your um, the pre-asked question area here, we were also asked, or you were asked, what are the popular trends within the healthcare industry and why are venture capitalists interested in them? Yeah, the, the, the biggest trend, and you're starting to see, or the, one of the biggest trends that we're paying attention to, and, and there's there's probably 10 or 15 that are on this list. I mean, we could talk about artificial intelligence. We could talk about computer vision. We could talk about remote patient monitoring. Um, these are all trends that are being tracked by investors, um, especially early stage investors, uh, aka venture capitalists in the healthcare industry. But one of the big kind of macro concepts that we look at is hospital at home, which is the, the basic idea of being able to take care of the patient beyond just the moments that they're within the four walls of the healthcare setting, typically called the hospital. Um, it was it's, it's always been a good idea, but up until the point where we had things like telehealth and remote patient monitoring, about the only time the clinician would get a touch point with any, a meaningful touch point with the patient is when the patient got in the car, drove to the parking lot, went to the doctor's office and got examined by the doctor. Now we could, now the doctor in principle can be keeping track of his or her patients, enti their entire patient population without that patient population coming to visit them. The, the glucose monitoring, all of the things that fall into the category of remote patient monitoring, and now the ability to do more and more with te uh, telemedicine and video telemedicine in particular means more of these, more of the care, more of the service, more of the therapy can be delivered digitally, telephonically through remote patient monitoring. And again, that goes back to the first thing I mentioned. That's that's good news for an industry that's not going to be able to build enough new hospitals with enough hospital beds to be able to accommodate what the United States needs per capita, given its healthcare uh, situation going from you know, 2021 to 2031 to 2041, where we add more and more and more and more seniors to the roster. And, and, I, and I will say, of course, it doesn't mean that, a, that a, a human being doesn't consume healthcare services 
prior to 65. It's just an acknowledgement that most of what the country spends on healthcare and most of the services it consumes are the people 65 and up, no big surprise. So uh, we have an audience member question, um, and I suspect we have possibly quite a few entre entrepreneurs here in the healthcare industry today. So you might see more of these types of questions. But Yu Chen asks, what stages, pre-seed, seed, et cetera, of startups do you invest in? And for each stage, what are the most important factors you're looking for? Oh, thank you for that question. And, and good question. I should have mentioned that in my intro. So our particular fund is set up specifically to discover and invest into healthcare companies that are at the seed stage. And for those of you that that can't uh, don't don't know the vocabulary there around the different stages of investing, the the startups and this is not unique to healthcare startups. Startups typically go from getting some self funding, maybe some friends and family funding. They, the company grows up a little bit more and it might get some investment from angels or angel investors, um, grows up a little bit more and it starts to then get funding from the, the world of venture capital. And then within the world of venture capital, where we, where we kick in is at the seed stage. And then there's Series A, and then, then it becomes alphabetical. There's Series A funding, Series B funding, Series C funding. And the companies generally become more and more mature as they get as they work through the alphabet going from angel investing to seed to series A, series B, series C, and the, the alphabet can keep going all the way up to sometimes, you know, E, F, and G. Um, what a seed stage company generally means, and, and I'll emphasis on the word generally because it, it can mean different things in different situations, but in general, it means the company is just getting out of the garage. The technology has been developed. It's not just a concept. It might even have a little bit of revenue, but it hasn't been fully proven out. Um, the later stage venture capitalists that like to take on less risk are going to are going to embrace the company and invest in the company once it has X millions of dollars of revenue, um, and the company's worth more. So, you know, in, in Shark Tank terminology, um, they're going to invest a few million dollars and get a smaller percent ownership in the company than I'm going to get if I invest earlier. I'm taking on more risk. My couple million dollars worth of investment is going to get me a bigger ownership stake in the company because the company is riskier. So we're generally speaking investing in companies that are really on either side of generating revenue. If they're generating revenue, they've got a little bit of revenue happening. The cash register has been plugged in, so to speak, for three months, six months, maybe a year, and they're starting to prove it out. And then if they aren't generating revenue, they're getting close to that moment. Um, what we don't do, just to further define the seed stage, what we don't invest in is is three or four you know, people that leave their day job or just graduated from school and have an idea and they want their idea funded, that's too early for us. And then too late for us would be a company that already has a few million dollars of revenue because um, we've just decided that's too far along for our particular formula to work. So I want to remind the audience, feel free to type a question in the chat or if you're feeling brave and you want to test out this platform, um, feel free to ask for us to pass the mic to you. But while we're waiting for the audience, um, I, I'm curious, are there any trends in healthcare right now that you think are going to start sparking more startups in the coming year or two? So something where you haven't seen it yet, but you think it's coming. Um, well, I think the, the first thing that jumps into my mind is a little bit obvious, but I'll still throw it out there, which is it's the trend of what's coming against the backdrop of what is now almost becoming obvious, but I'll, but I'll make the point anyway, because it, it's so foundational to what's going on in healthcare. I don't know the age of everybody on the on this on the Zoom call, but I'm going to guess that everybody on the Zoom call can remember not too long ago 
when you went to the doctor, you went to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned, you walked up to the front counter, you checked in with the receptionist, and if you looked up behind the receptionist were six or eight or 10 or 12 file cabinets. And all those file cabinets were full of our paper-based medical records. Well, what's happened over the last 10 or 15, in some cases, 20 years is we have gradually embraced electronic medical record systems, EMRs, or sometimes known as EHRs, the electronic health record systems. And if you take a step back and you think about almost all of the innovation that's going on in healthcare, most of what I look at, the technology isn't what's new. It's the fact that the technology needed the healthcare industry to have at its foundation digitized health records. You couldn't have remote patient monitoring if the remote patient monitoring gizmo had to talk to a file cabinet that breaks down. And if the file cabinet had to talk to a remote patient monitoring uh, medical device, it breaks down. So we had to, we had to as a nation and really as a world, we had to get all of our paper-based electronic, our paper-based medical records converted into electronic medical records so that all the other digital wizardry that entrepreneurs are working on in all different aspects, all different kinds of medicine and med medical specialty on the back end, on the administrative side of hospitals, on the side of hospitals that touch patients, such as digital health, that had to be in place in order for all these entrepreneurs to come out of the woodwork and have a shot at being commercially successful. Otherwise, they would have had a technology that just couldn't talk to that paper record. And it's not, a, and it wasn't a trivial amount of work. I mean, all of these hospitals, all these health systems, all the way down to the small doctor's office that's just got a, you know, a one man or one woman operation, all of that had to become electronic before a lot of other things could bolt onto it. And I think that's the, one of the major things that have happened in the healthcare industry going back about 15 or 20 years ago until just yesterday, so to speak that is allowing a lot of this other innovation to be commercially viable. Again, recognizing that an awful lot of what I look at, it's not the technology that's new. I mean, my favorite example is telehealth. We had the phone 143 years ago, right? It's not, it's not the fact that Apple came out with the latest iPhone that's making telehealth viable. It's that telehealth had to connect into something that digital. There were also some, you know, legislative and, and regulatory things. Doctors had to get paid for telehealth for it to be for it to work. It had to become not illegal in certain states, which it had been until very recently. A whole bunch of things came together to make telehealth work. But one of the things that had to come together is we had to have electronic medical records. Otherwise it was these various innovations were just going to be too inefficient when they were interacting with analog paper and pencil. So uh, we have another question here for you, um, pop, maybe a big question. As we're coming to post-pandemic time, what areas in the industry that showed up during the pandemic are here to stay or will go away? I think that maybe maybe on the stay here side of things is going to be testing. We we no longer have to speculate about COVID variants. You know, we're we're learning a lot about uh, Delta, the 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 new variant that is the mo that is that is more lethal than the original the original COVID. And although it's way over my pay grade, it's not it's not too out there to assume that COVID and viruses are going to be with us. And so far, so good. The vaccines that have been created for COVID original are holding up against some of the first few variants. Either way, unless everything works perfectly, unless we get very lucky, testing is going to be with us. We're, we're going to continue to be at a place where for our, for our economy to work, we want to have confidence that the people we are with in various settings, whether it's a music concert, whether it's the cruise ship I talked about earlier, whether it's a classroom at a, on a college campus, whether it's an assembly line at a manufacturing plant, we're going to want to know that the person to the left and to the right and in the front or in the behind us, or even just four people in an elevator, 
don't have a deadly virus. So this ability to test and to get better at testing, and I think better really has two components, to be able to get the results back faster and to have the results be more accurate, both in, both in terms of false positives and false negatives. That's an important thing that's here to stay, our view is. We, we, we're going to need that, we're going to need that confidence um, and, and speed is very important. Most of what we've done in terms of our testing over the last 14 or 15 months, as we've gotten the hang of, you know, most Americans have done more uh, virus testing in the last 14 or 15 months than they had in their entire life. And yet almost all of that is go to a facility get swabbed and then hold your breath for 12 hours or 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours until you get your results back. And that works for some situations, but that doesn't work if you want to go to Disneyland today. If you want to go to Disneyland and you want to be in a Disneyland that doesn't have anybody that are, po- that are positive for a deadly virus, you want to know that everybody walking through the turnstile at Disneyland took the same test. The test is close to 100% accurate. And for the sake of the Disneyland example, everybody's able to get through that line, maybe with a 10 or 15 minute delay, but they're not going to wait 12 hours to go to Disneyland uh, upon, you know, doing the swab. So testing, I think, is here to stay, um, just given where we are today with COVID, what we've learned just in the last three or four months, and then looking at the trajectory going out. Um, The other half of your question, I think, is, you know, what may be what maybe dissipates. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I know. I'm not sure I know what, what things we've been preoccupied with or alarmed about that we won't continue to be at least some, it, it may diminish, um, you know, face masks is an obvious, is an obvious one. Face masks have diminished in, in some states that have relaxed recently, but it doesn't mean, you know, even, even here in Los Angeles, it's kind of hit and miss. You can go to one restaurant and they want you to wear a face mask. You can go to the next restaurant and they don't. So whereas two months ago, everybody wanted face masks on in, in public settings. So, um, but it doesn't mean face masks are going away. So I think that, I think nothing maybe goes back to complete normal. I think some things go back to a fraction of what normal used to be. Um, you know, a perfect example is return to work. That just in the last week or ten days, there's been more and more and more big corporations that have finally taken a stance on when and how they want their employees to come back to the office. Do they, are they insisting on five days a week? Are they insisting on a hybrid schedule? Do they want to let employees work from home on Mondays and Fridays, knowing that that's a surefire way to end up extending weekends? We're, we're wrestling with that, but many large employers are at least moving in the direction of getting back to semi-normal. It's just a question of whether or not work from home versus work at work is a hybrid or it's, it's all one way or all the other. So you have a, a, a return audience member who thanks you for one of your earlier answers. And they ask, uh, going back to the trend hospital at home, what are the challenges for us to get there in both technical and policy aspects? Well, I'll take a shot at answering the question that weaves the two together, and it, it has to do with what in the industry is called alert fatigue, or that's one term for it, which is at the extreme, if your doctor is monitoring all of his or her patients when they are outside four walls of the clinic or the hospital, then that means a lot of data is coming from their patient roster back to them. And it's almost a be careful what you wish for situation. Now, now that doctors has uh, an almost unlimited amount of data about your, you know, your blood pressure and how much sleep you got last night and what you ate and what you weigh and on and on and on and on and on. And in theory, that helps them take better care of your health. But then there's the, the pragmatic side of this, which is how do they ingest and react all of that data? When do they decide that you are outside some norm and you need to get called at two o'clock in the afternoon, but somebody else doesn't need to call at two o'clock in the afternoon because they're kind of in their zone. Um, So one of the things that we're going to have to wrestle with in terms of 
regulatory. There's some legal implications here. There's certainly some financial implications here is what the industry is going to do and how it's going to streamline the data going from at the home or outside the clinic back to the physician to do something with that information. And the good news is we don't have, you know, we don't have all 350 million of us wired up sending data into our doctor. So we should be able to gradually work through this over the next X years. I think X is probably five years or so we're going to get the hang of this, but it's a real issue. And, and if it means doctors have to spend more time looking at data, they might want to do that, but that's, but it goes back to monetizing their time. They can't be looking at all of this data that's coming into them from these different medical device sources, these different remote patient monitoring sources, if they're not being compensated to look at and react to that data. The good news is there are a lot of uh, billing codes now where doctors can be compensated for looking at this data that is coming back to them. And of course, the payers have every incentive in the world for this to start working because they, they would gladly pay the doctors a little bit more to be on top of a medical condition that is developing versus waiting for that, that medical condition to exasperate to the point where it becomes expensive. In other words, better to be able to catch the heart attack 30 days before it would have otherwise happened versus letting the patient have the heart attack. And, and now the, the cost of care goes up, you know, 10 X or a hundred X compared to what it would be if you could have caught it and prevented it from happening in the first place. So it's a place where the insurance industry and the, and the providers of healthcare are very well aligned. So Shazad asks, how do you evaluate competitiveness, defensibility in a pitch from a seed stage startup? So that's a good question. And that was the other half of the question that came out right at the beginning. And I forgot to ask the, I forgot to answer the second half of the question, which is around, you know, our criteria. So we are investing early, which means I don't get the benefit of looking at, you know, five years of financial records and doing a very sterile financial analysis on these companies. There's usually very little to analyze. Um, I, I don't get to put on my Excel hat, in other words, very often or for very long and look deeply at the financial side of these companies because they don't have a financial side yet. And if they do, they barely have a financial side. So we're spending much more time getting to know the team. Uh, if you've heard the phrase, you know, you've been the jockey not the horse. That's that's exactly what we do. We're, we're we're betting on the the our conviction or lack thereof that the team has what it takes to get this business off the ground. Um, we need to know it's a good concept, um, but in healthcare, the vast majority of the businesses we look at are good concepts. They're all things that we are rooting for. Almost every pitch I hear is from an entrepreneur who has a product or a technology or a service that I would want the world to have. It doesn't mean they're all equally financially viable or, or, uh, or in other ways good for the healthcare industry, but they all start from the, a place of they're solving an important problem in the healthcare system in the United States or a healthcare problem that goes on everywhere in the world. Um, so we will we will look at all of the usual suspects. We will look at the financials. We will look at the patents if the company has it. We will look at how the company is progressing with the FDA, for example, if it's a medical device. Um, but we will really zero in on the composition, the character, the trustworthiness, the experience of the team that's getting that business off the ground. Because at the end of the day, that's the hardest part about entrepreneurship is is having that that almost intangible to be able to persevere over two or three or four really hard years trying to get your product developed and then into the market with some commercial success. And then the last thing I'll mention, which is, which is important for uh, those of you on this call that are, that are either thinking about launching a healthcare business or have launched a, a healthcare business. And this is, this is not necessarily intuitive. In fact, in some cases, it's counterintuitive, which is a venture capitalist, generally speaking, and, and probably very close to always, is not interested in investing in companies that go on to become financially successful. And you know, I, I usually pause there when I make that statement just to let that sink in. I, 
that's not enough for a venture capitalist because the economics of a venture fund, because behind me are t- these 200 investors, my 200 investors are not interested in me investing in companies that become five, 10, 15 million dollar profitable businesses, even though that's that's an incredibly successful thing to be able to accomplish. The only way we really win, we being the fund, is when you become successful enough to be acquired or have an IPO. That's the liquidity event. That's the home run for the founder, for the entrepreneur that started the company. But that's how a meaningful amount of money gets returned back to the fund. So the fund can return money back to its investors. Simply becoming a longstanding company that continues to grow a little bit year over year, five years, 10 years, 15 years later, that unfortunately can't be the motivation of a venture capitalist. So if that's the trajectory that your business is going to be on, you want to spend more time finding investors of other types versus trying to court or make attractive your business to venture capitalists because we're singularly focused on what is called the exit or the liquidity event for the company. Looks like we have a a last minute question here. I I know you have time for probably this last one or maybe one more after this. Um, So it looks like a follow up question. Could you share some of your portfolio companies? Oh, I'd be happy to. And in fact, if anybody's interested, our our website is wavemaker360.com and every company that we've invested in is there. So um, we have been one of the most active, if not the most active healthcare investor in the United States over the last three years, three and a half years. We've invested in 39 companies and, and we turn three years old next month. So 39 companies in 35 months. Um, so there's way too many in our portfolio, even over a short period of time to be able to reference um, but here in town, for example, in Pasadena, uh, a company called Avid Science, which was doing some very interesting work in the world of uh, research information and artificial intelligence, uh, got off the ground here in Pasadena, and in fact was our first exit. So they're a they're a particularly uh, we're particularly proud of that company. They we invested in them about two years ago, and they very very much ahead of schedule got acquired by a private private equity backed company and so our investors had a nice a nice financial win on that company um, we are trying to think of some of our Los Angeles companies in case there are other other folks that are in and around Pasadena or in and around Southern California were investors in a company called Giblib which uh, came out of uh, came from a founder out of USC Giblib dubs itself as the Netflix of medical education. So if you can imagine surgeons needing to stay on top of their craft, um, they can do so by going to medical conferences and learning the greatest, la- the latest, greatest new techniques around how to perform old surgeries or new surgeries. Um, or they can get that same information in 4D and virtual reality videos and not have to leave their practice, not have to get an airplane, not have to go to a medical conference. We actually invested in this company well before COVID, but as you can imagine, as I'm telling the story, how much more in demand online medical education is for doctors during COVID than it was pre-COVID. I mean, it, it made us look very good to have invested in this company before the pandemic hit, because now almost no doctor would want to, nor could they even find an in-person medical conference to attend in order to learn the latest, greatest, and earn their continuing medical education credits that they need to, to keep their license. So um, Giblib has ended up becoming uh, almost a benefactor of the pandemic because their product went from nice to have to need to have as doctors were unwilling or unable to get on airplanes and go to medical conferences to to receive their ongoing medical education. That's a, that's a couple examples of uh, companies that we've invested in. And our Innovate Pasadena um, event and marketing manager has shared the link for your website as well in the chat for anyone that's interested. So we have one sure. more question here. Last one. Um, what's the average check size for your investment? Do you often 
Oh, yeah, good. Also a good question. Um, we almost always write check size. We, we have a two check strategy. So when we invest at the seed stage, which we almost always invest in the seed stage, our first check into the company is going to be between 250 and 500,000. And it's usually into a round that's somewhere between one, one and a half million, the full round up to maybe a four or five million dollar round. Um, and I mentioned it's a two check strategy. What we then do typically is follow those companies, help those companies as much as we can. And we reserve between 2X and 4X our initial investment to be able to double down, triple down, quadruple down on the high performing companies when they go out for their series A. So we'll get up to two and a half million dollars into a company between the seed stage and the series A um, if that company is performing particularly well. As to whether or not we lead, we're basically agnostic. We sometimes lead, we sometimes co-lead, and we sometimes don't lead, and we don't have a rule of thumb. But the only rule of thumb that we have around funding companies vis-a-vis -vis the round is that we never, what I call cowboy invest. We never look at a company, fall so madly in love that we become the one and only investor in that round. We will always work with the company and the company's other investors. We may even bring in some investors of our own into the round so that the company ends up with 250000 to 500000 of our dollars. But those dollars are surrounded by other investors, which, which could include other venture funds, other angels or angel groups. It could include money coming from hospitals. Increasingly, we're co-investing with hospitals. We, For example, here in Southern California, we've co-invested with Cedar sinai I think, four or five times in the last three years. We've co-invested with the Mayo Clinic. So we'll, we'll typically co-invest with a group of between three and maybe eight to 10 other investors to make that round come together. And we do that for two reasons. One, we want the company to have more capital to be able to make more forward progress. And two, most of those other investors that are being that are participating in the round bring something to the table. We have a particular value add that we bring to the company in the form of being able to help them with their commercial go-to-market strategy other investors might know quite a bit about digital marketing or might know more about product development or might have a focus on deep tech or AI or something that is not in our wheelhouse, more expertise that early stage company can acquire by virtue of working with a, a, a larger but still manageable set of investors, the greater the likelihood of success is. So that's why we stick to that formula of always trying to come together with a, a small syndicate of, invest, of investors to make up the overall round. Well, I suspect you have at least a handful of healthcare startup entrepreneurs in the audience today. Um, and everyone, you're getting some thanks for all of your answers here about uh, um, investment strategies. How should these entrepreneurs reach out if they feel that they have a startup that sort of fits the criteria been, that has been discussed here today? What's the best way for them to get in touch or to approach, you know, even other investors? Anybody that's interested in learning more about our fund and, and really on both sides of the equation. Um, I, put, I, I hope I just posted my email address in the comments. So I assume it's going to everybody. Um, but if it you didn't did. get there, um, J, initial J Goss, G-O-S-S, -S, at wavemaker360.com. Um, happy to talk to entrepreneurs that think, based on this short talk, that they might be a good fit for, their business might be a good fit for our fund, as well as, you know, we're, we're constantly adding uh, individuals to our fund that are interested in becoming part of it. So on all fronts, I'm happy to have those conversations and um please do reach out to me, shoot me an email, and I will definitely get back to you. Jay, thank you so much for taking time out of your, especially your lunch time today, um, to join us, to answer all of our questions. Healthcare, a big growing industry in Pasadena, so we're really excited to learn more about Wavemaker. Um, and again, thank you for supporting Innovate Pasadena as well. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us today. Um, and check us out again in a couple of weeks for our next Ask Me Anything. Jay Goss, Wavemaker 360. Bye, everybody. Thank you.